The Construct Cast is made possible by viewers like you. Please visit us at commutationconstruct.locals.com. Memberships are free to start with coupon code CCFREE. Hello and welcome back to the Construct Cast. I'm your host, James Darian, and it is a pleasure to be back here with you. Today, we are continuing our Rise and Fall of Empire series, and the main topic, the main work that I'm doing today is going to be an analysis of Sir John Glubb's um, The Fate of Empires and Search for Survival. Um, this is an essay that he, that he put out. He's a historian from England. Um, this was put out back in the 70s. It was an analysis uh, for his time, and I think it's it's definitely still relevant today, uh, to say the least. Uh, so if you see me looking down a lot, that's because I'm actually I've got his paper in front of me. I've taken seven pages of notes on my notebook here, so I've got a lot to go through. I'm gonna try to get through this as quick as I can for you guys, but I do want to try to make it um, as full as I can. Bring out the th bring out the. Uh, Details I think are important to me and kind of relate to what I talked about with uh, traditional progressivism or pro progressive traditionalism, uh, however you want to say it. Uh, so, with that all said, uh, let's just get into it. So, first off, I'm going to lay out the framework of the stages of life that Sir John Glubb discussed. Um, he believes that based on his analysis, more or less, all empires go through a life cycle of about 250 years, about 10 generations or so. That's how they calculate it, 25 years to a generation, uh, with 250 being about 10. And there is variance in there, of course, with how long empires last. But that is the average that, they, uh, that his model's working with, looking at historical empires. Um, and what you can typically see from them. So, uh, these em empires tend to go through, from his analysis, about six stages of throughout their life cycle. So they have they start off with the pioneering stage. Uh, that he also, he calls it the outburst. Uh, basically, when they suddenly grow and expand and take over. Um, and it, and it, he calls it an outburst because the essentially when empires are first formed they tend to grab territory very quickly uh they may conquer another empire and cl and immediately claim all their land or go through a series of battles to just take land at one after another um so they start with a pioneering uh stage then immediately after that there is the conquest stage. That is a stage where, all right, uh, we've created our empire. Now we need more territory. Uh, and a bit simultaneously, slightly behind it, is the commerce stage. Basically, as territories are conquered, won through war or treaty or what, whatever, how, however, generally military action. Um, and... In American terms, you could say manifest destiny to an extent. You could say manifest destiny, uh, the U.S. conquering all of the U.S., conquering the uh, land area of the U.S. Um, and was sort of our conquest period. And following behind the conquest uh, is commerce because as the military is progressively making more and more action to take over land to, to conquer more territory for the empire you get more um you get more goods more needs of course the military uh they may need some amount of supplies too so their supply lines are being set up as the military is going and then people start to inhabit the lands that get conquered uh people move in people start businesses they start trade uh it leads to more diverse goods and whatnot so you, you you can see how there's a clear um like cohabitation of these two uh periods so 
conquest is taking over the land commerce is basically filling up the land as it's taken so they're not quite in sync but one but commerce is right behind conquest um for my brief overview of that and then we after that we get into the age of affluence so this is the age where essentially uh commerce hit its peak wealth is everywhere people you are now a wealthy nation people are living good and they no longer um they they no longer really hold on to all the ideals of conquest uh, maybe they even think that conquest is immoral or bad uh it, it's it's sort of the age where uh, where a lot of morality starts to come into the way people uh, judge the past, the present, and themselves. And it, it, it seems almost like in order to make up for the loss in um, in honor and sort of doing for your country, people tend to uh, move towards making moral claims to justify their own actions their own or their own inaction um and, and this is basically a period of luxury uh, you're kind of like riding the waves of the big commerce boom and um so th that's kind of where that settles in uh after that you get the period of intellect which apparently throughout history uh when the wealth ages uh, a bit. Well, the wealth from the commerce and affluence age uh, begins to um, begins to age, uh, and the generations from the commerce age, the, or even the younger ones from it, while they uh, while they're getting close to their end, they tend to invest a lot of their money into philanthropy and. Um, and creating universities is actually one of the big ones. Um, apparently, during between the lives of two uh, emperors in back in the Arab Empire, we there were there were only uh, universities in two of the big cities for one emp emperor. And by the time his son was uh, in his heyday of ruling the empire there were universities in every city so th this is something that is apparently recurrent throughout history which is kind of crazy to uh see that it's so consistent such a big such a um such uh what's the word i'm looking for it, it's it's crazy it's such a consistent and recurring event uh throughout history that we we get this period of intellect where people stop doing and start th start thinking stop doing so it's less it's less about action it's more about uh discussion and, and almost about inaction but just the uh, intellectual growth of society uh and then the intellectual growth this is our second to last period uh it it ends up leading to almost a loss of morality. People lose their connections with God. They lose their connections with uh, the morals of their foundings and the ethos that drove their people to become as successful as they are. And now they're sort of, believe it or not, pop, throughout history, pop music has come in uh, and made, driven up uh, sexual deviance, sexual... Um, Basically, sexual immorality is the term uh, that John Glubb uses, Sir John Glubb, and uh, things like uh, women entering the uh, entering the political sphere and uh, traditional man uh, spaces. So, leaving the home, going more to work, that sort of thing. Uh, the development of five day work weeks, and uh, yeah, there there's a lot of things that again throughout history through roman empire arab empire british empire all of these things have happened leading to the fall of these empires and, and it's not to say that uh at the end of the empires that the nation stops existing but it's just no longer the superpower that it was before that like um the british no longer control all the seas essentially with their navy or stuff like that so uh 
that's kind of the stages I'm, that he has. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the later stages because I feel like they're more relevant to where we are today. But I, I do want to give a bit of a point towards uh, the pioneering stage and the conquest stage as to um, sort of where I bring up this my idea of uh, the, the progressive traditionalism as sort of a concept and a need for society. Um, so to get started with this, um, and, oh, and, and I know everyone's going to have questions about that woman thing. So I will actually, uh, go into a bit of what he says about that. Cause I know everyone's going to be curious about that. Cause that definitely doesn't sit well, uh, talking about something like, oh, women should not be in politics, um, <laughs> in <laughs> the modern day. So I'm just going to talk about uh, the historical context of how this has happened. So let's not uh, focus on that right now. But yeah, it, it's just something funny that stood out to me that I think is a bit politically incorrect that we're going to have some fun with. So going by um, what Glub said about the outburst. So with the outburst, it, it's essentially... There, there doesn't necessarily need to be a triggering event, but there can be a triggering event wherein essentially maybe people who were slaves decide to, decide to, to rebel. Uh, in the U.S., you have the U.S. Uh, rebelling against the um, British Empire, and we immediately got all of, all of our colonies from that. Like All the colonies turned into the states. Um, immediately with that and you can see sort of and there is a consistent um period throughout history where just people um people who i am not on the right page hold on oh yes i am huh weird Okay, I guess I didn't take too many notes on the um, on the uh, outburst thing. Um, well, it, it, the outburst is pretty uh, plain and does go straight into conquest. But essentially, um, with the outburst, they are the people are rebelling against a um, either a currently existing empire they may be maybe they're just a small isolated group and they they reach a point where they just a lot of times they'll be suffering they'll be poor um and starved half starved or just uh, in dire need of essentially in dire need of nourishment to maintain their society from both a physical food perspective like they, they literally might be on on the edge of starvation and also from the perspective of um of keeping their people and their lands uh together and most of that comes with the nutrition aspect like like they they literally might be out of food and just needing to expand to be able to get more uh food they, they all sorts of things can go on um in uh for uh what was this i, I think this is part of the arab empire where just like or maybe it was a different empire before that there were a number of arab empires or a number of almost every type of empire has existed in multiple forms um throughout history so uh, there was an empire um, formed immediately after Muhammad did his speakings. And uh, let's see if he actually says which one this is. Yeah. Okay. So this is the Arab empire. Um, that's what I was thinking about. I'll, I'll get into some of the other stuff later. That's confusing me. But um, just because there was another one later. But so the Arab empire uh, started right after uh, Muhammad was preaching for his 20 years or so and within 20 years the arabs had conquered the persian empire then the persian empire was gone just like 20 years after muhammad died 
So that that kind of shows just how quickly and how these uh, uprisings expand and take over. Uh, with the U.S., we we fought back against the British and got all of the colonies um, as a as an independent nation. Like we we signed our Declaration of Independence in 1776, and we had our Constitution and Bill of Rights uh done by 1791 uh, 1791 was when bill of rights went in uh it was four years before that when we got the uh constitution the current constitution so you can see that like the the outburst happens quick uh, it tends to be ragtag and tends to be people who feel they're they have some kind of motivation be it religious be it um hunger for food be it uh that they were previously oppressed now they're not like the spanish empire start the year the spanish empire became an empire uh was the year that they funded christopher columbus that was that was what that was right after the last arab kingdom in spain fell um so you see that as soon as people essentially get the opportunity to expand after going through hard times, not really being able to be a full empire, not being able to be a superpower, uh, they tend to just come in and take over. Uh, even with the uh, with the Roman Empire over the Roman Republic, and you can see that it actually got divided into two periods, at least by um, at least by the wor- the way uh, Glub chose to organize it. He actually sees the Republic as one entity and the Empire as another, where the Emperor came in and took over. So there actually was a dif- differentiation where the Roman Republic was a city-state type of system, and the Empire was a whole collective of nations uh, in one thing. So th- there is a bit of a give and take here. There is some difference between the way... Um, just the way the political system is organized so it it can it can still be the same state but if it's organized differently it could be a new empire like uh when the Ro- romanov empire fell in russia the soviet union immediately became a thing uh if the us gave up its constitution and became a socialist country it would be a new, it, it would essentially be a new empire um, probably not a good one, but it'd be a new one. Uh, so th- that's kind of the way these empires and their outbursts work. Um, there's really not too much I can really say about this, but the, it, it's, it, the main aspect of it is the people are hardy, they're hardworking, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to get a hold of something, to, to gain their power. They're, they They will basically risk their lives. They will do whatever they can. And, um, yeah, so, but, and this may be worth noting, they tend to be homogenous. Um, they tend to be homogenous groups and this actually helps them from a cultural level. They are all the same culture. Uh, that's kind of the aspect that Glob approaches with this, that the people are all one culture and this is, um, this is sort of vital to their stability. Uh, so immediately after they form, and, and again, we're gonna we're gonna follow the track of the U.S. for this for how I'm gonna be approaching this. You have the period of conquest and commerce. So conquest uh, immediately we think of in the U.S. manifest destiny, destiny. I think that would be the first thing to come to any American's mind when it comes to uh, conquest and us getting more land, getting more power. Well, not necessarily more power, but well, power kind of comes with it. But we're getting more land, conquering more settlements, um, taking over where the natives were, pushing them off, and making it ours. That's kind of that is the period that follows it. Um, and I, I, again, a lot of this is also th- th- there's a bit of a difficulty in kind of segregating each of these periods in the early ones. Um, even when I was reading through Glub's work for the second time, I was seeing that like uh, the the conquest and the the pioneering slash outburst phase is very overlapping with the conquest phase because 
Um, even here, I've, I've got that the, uh, that the pioneering phase is character characterized by reckless bravery. Um, it, it, they're becoming more organized because they adopt the struck, they adopt the military structure of the, the previous empire, the ones that they conquered, um, because they want to have that kind of form, that kind of power. They kind of want to embody what they were only in their own way. Um, uh, they, they're going to be incredibly disciplined and professional because they have a goal. They are, they are fixed on, on a, obtaining that goal and they are going out and just doing what they can to do it. Um, so yeah, so, oh yeah. And, and they're very practically minded. They're going to, they're going to improvise. Th these are, these aren't generally like well-educated people. These are people who um they're street smart they they were born they were born into they were born in poverty they grew up in poverty uh, they just see the world as it is and they use that as their their motivation to action um so that's kind of, that's what leads them uh and yet you have so with that that's kind of the lead then you have the military conquest which is hey we're taking over more lands we, we're kind of more settled we've got our military organized and we're using our military to conquer lands and to um sort of set, set the stage for what's to come in the u.s uh let me uh just yeah so in the u.s we've got a few actions throughout history um I, I'm not sure if something like the Alamo would be would count for this, but but I think it would. Uh, and all these other actions, basically taking taking over the West, uh, the Western half of the U.S. That is, um, and, and then commerce follows. You have like the gold rush, and you have uh, trade across. You have uh, Lewis and Clark's expeditions, and all this. Um, you have the Oregon Trail. I think I think these these are the aspects that people are talking about when they're talking about the period of con conquest and commerce. So, um, and generally, uh, these are things that have existed throughout history. Uh, the distance doesn't really matter, uh, even in as as long as it there's one empire to control the lands and create a a stable environment like there's not the ransacking and pillaging going on from barbarians that um could otherwise go on the, the the when it's the nation is approaching its peak of power um there's just that stability where even if it takes six months to cross a land you can still do it um so so it is something that's happened throughout history it happened in the roman empire happened uh in that the arab empire happened probably in chinese empire she has to go into the chinese in this but uh, it, it basically happened in all these different eras uh the, the silk road there was one um so the the ease of trade ha basically comes with these empires as they grow and as they sort of conquer lands um and as, as a sort of adopt more of the structure of sort of the empires they've seen before them while also sort of giving it their own take. Um, so what is that? Yeah. Um, and again, so I should probably go into this a bit. So during the age of uh, conquest, you can almost see this as a duo side thing. You have the military side and the civ and the uh, civilian side of um, of the actions going on, where the military side, the military men are motivated motivated by honor and they want they, they want to become famous too they like they want to be well known for their discoveries and they want to be heroes and they want to really just um live for their nation um very very patriotic very much very much uh i don't want to say idealistic but very morally grounded you could say 
towards uh, their god, their their god, their men, uh, their country, their god, their country, their uh, fellow men. Um, wh- whereas on the commercial side, uh, they don't really care as much about that other stuff. So they they may care a bit more about building their community, um, but for the most part, they're they're not seeking the honor. Uh, they're they're seeking coin. They they they're they are seeking. Um, they are seeking to make money and to sell their goods, to buy goods, trade goods, all that. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and when this happens, uh, essentially, early bird gets the worm. The first ones in who do a really good job uh, become super successful, hyper wealthy. To put it mildly, they, they are the Rockefellers of uh, of our world. Um, if you think of the U.S., yeah, Rockefeller would be a great example because he he came in. We we had some budding industry. He came into the oil industry, saw as, as this floundering thing that was just starting, and basically took over made it a massive international deal it's export and all that and he brought in tons of money to the u.s and his family is still probably up there as one of the richest uh families in the u.s just from his activities alone so yeah you, you can see how during this time uh that's kind of what you can see the amount of growth both both institutionally and commercially that was going on uh, during these dual, duo periods as I kind of consider them um, and again they're led by people who are who have a lot of a high sense of duty pride virtue that's what's important to them all right so we get into now the age of affluence so, Sir John Glubb considers the age of affluence the turning point in a nation. Uh, essentially, he, he he sees it as looking at it from a clock. He sees he sees um, the the point between the age of commerce and affluence as high noon for the uh, for the nation. So essentially, you're done kind of you're done expanding you're done kind of commercially growing and now you're starting to head into the decline um so looking looking at the life cycle we're this is going to be around halfway through uh and glub pinpointed this for the u.s to be around the age of woodrow wilson's presidency so kind of worth noting that was over a hundred years ago uh that was when the u.s abandoned its um ab- abandoned its depreciating coin where that was making americans very wealthy to to a depreciating uh a depreciating dollar uh that was that gets printed on debt to a centralized bank so you can see kind of oh wait that kind of makes sense we're the country's starting to get poor we're going we're we're printing our money on debt so uh and again that's kind of just throwing out my own thing there about the because i don't like the fed uh but i don't i I don't like that our money is printed on debt so (laughs) i'm giving a little bit of personal opinion with this but you can see how um but this is kind of just sort of bringing in what i'm talking about we've got um essentially we've reached a point in our wealth where our virtues are starting to decline. You can think of, think of this, think of the Roaring Twenties a bit with this. Like people are kind of just like racking in the money, living it up, and uh, really, really enjoying the luxury that they are able to obtain. There is, uh, there is, there is a beginning decline in a lack of virtue. P- people don't really care as much as of doing their commerce for their community or their fellow man they're kind of just like doing it to get their name in lights they want to be celebrity they want to be cool and uh, they want they want to have for themselves um 
And it, it, it's kind of interesting that this is a very self-serving period, but at the end of the day, it, it, it leads to the intellect period, which is spurred by philanthropy. So I, I'm, I'm going to walk through this a little bit, but this is, this is a period where um, schools sort of stop training uh training their attendants uh he, he, he says training their bo boy schools in the writing because i think um of course b during this period this is sort of the period right before women really actively start getting involved in everything so school is more university college that's more of, so of a guy's thing at this point of a nation's life um Women are still in the home generally at this time. So the schools prior to this were really focused on training men to be strong, uh, virtuous men who would were very upstanding and uh, doing for the culture, doing for the people and uh, giving to their nation, self-sacrificing, uh, martyrdom. That was kind of the ethos of higher education up to this point. This is kind of the period where schools are just like, yeah, we're going to train you to make money. We're we're going to train you to get a high paying job. We're we're uh, we want we want you to be a computer scientist. We want you to be an economist. We want you to be something that's going to give you enough money to give back to us. <laughs> that kind of attitude, I, I I is kind of my interpretation of it. So so yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I just just want to verify my notes. I'm not used to having notes while I'm, while I'm doing these for you guys. So I'm sorry if it's if I'm a little uh paused. There's just so much details to uh which uh, what what club wrote about. I just want to make sure I get some of the stuff right and uh make sure I hit on the points that really stood out to me. Um but yeah, so uh, um there is that so the the main thing is the change in ethos and, and and again so they're giving up their sense of adventure for their desire for wealth um and in this period there's also a bit of a this is this is a period where moralism starts to become a thing you see people uh start to sort of even um to not they don't want to conquest they kind of just want to defend themselves and protect the money that they've earned they they don't want to go and gain more land and and more uh, territory in order to gain more they're kind of satisfied and just want to make sure nothing else gets in their way um so like uh like the US didn't join World War 1 or World War 2 in order to conquer more lands. We we uh, we joined World War 2 because we were spit on. <laughs> we we like we were spit on by Japan. <laughs> uh it, that's a reference to the history of Japan if anyone's ever seen that um that video online, but um yeah, so they there's less of a desire to sacrifice, less of a will to sacrifice, actually might be better to say. Um, and there becomes this moralism where not only do is the sacrifice to conquer seen as negative, it, it, it seen as undesirable, it's, it's seen as negative. It, it becomes seen as an immorality to go out and do these things. It's It's seen... It, it it begins to almost self-serve morally to the point where um, because the people of this period are no longer willing to make those sacrifices vices to do the things that require that moral fortitude. Um, so they kind of justify to themselves by saying, oh, we're actually more moral than them. We, we, it, it it's a it's a self-serving psychology where they degrade what was for what is um and that's really to justify their own lives of luxury to an extent because because they because it seems like since it's so close to that age of conquest there's almost a feeling of well one they're not getting to go do that like the option almost isn't there 
um, in a way. But at this, at, at least in the U.S., there wasn't really an option for it in that way. But also, there's like, there's kind of that feeling with that. Uh, not only can't you do it, but like you 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 don't really want to. But and you you won't, maybe you feel guilty for it for not wanting to do that. So in order to combat your own guilt, uh, the people would moralize and be like, oh, I'm actually better than you because I'm not doing that. All right. So that brings us right into the age of intellect. Yes. So this is comes from the philanthropy that comes at the end of the age of um, affluence. The, and also a lot of it comes from the age of commerce, like as that generation is dying out. So there, there might, there is, again, these ages are relatively generational. So the, the people from the age of commerce may not all die by the time you get to the end of the age of affluence. And the people at the time begin to, the age of commerce, as they begin to die, they, as they get close to death, they begin to do a lot of philanthropy because they do care about their communities and all of those moral aspects that the affluent people don't necessarily care about as much. And then the affluent people see and they, they kind of get into it too because they're like, hey, this makes me look good um, kind of thing. Uh, and with this, at least that's my understanding based on what um, – what I read. And with this, you have um, basically universities expand and are built in nearly every city within a nation, within an empire. Uh, so, and, and that's a hallmark of this age is that universities are built in every empire. So, uh, how long have we had universities in pretty much every state and every major city? And even in some of the smaller ones, how long have we had those in the U.S. now? I'm, I'm getting a little worried. I, I'm feeling close. <laughs> I'm, fe I'm, I'm feeling like, oh, we, we are well past halfway. But, um, excuse me. But, um, yeah, so that's kind of crazy uh at, at this point people sort of start to want to appreciate more intellectual curiosities it, they don't care as much about obtaining wealth and i'm gonna admit i fall straight into this kind of category of person i don't care too much about becoming super rich but if i can if i can fill my intellectual needs i'm gonna be super happy heck that's why i do this website and it's pretty much written into my about me so you guys can see sort of uh how i can how i relate to this um but yeah so the but the problem with this is and, and this is where i differentiate myself from it a bit too is that uh my, my i specifically took out the, took this quote out from what glove was said what sir glove was saying uh and he said amid a babble of talk the ship drifts onto the rocks um, essentially everyone's so caught up in their own intellectualism and talking about the things that are important and all the, uh, maybe the science and the, and uh, there are great strides in science and art and poetry and philosophy during these times. But the problem is, uh, they're not really steering the ship. They're not paying attention to the foundation of the culture of the society they're not paying attention to the um to the leadership of the nation as much possibly they're not paying attention to their military uh, they're not really conquering anything uh, they are defensive but they're kind of meekly defensive they're not really th that gusto uh is just not there for like the betterment of the nation so you've got that kind of aspect going on and people don't really feel the need for sacrifice anymore there's almost there's almost a greed and a and sort and this self uh the self ag i can say this word self a grand <laughs> self 
aggrandization is that proper i don't think that's proper but we're, we're gonna go with it so um self-aggrandizing aspect where people begin to think across the society that all of humanity's woes can be resolved through through intellect and through uh through belief systems and and that there is no need for sacrifice scarcity doesn't matter none of these things come up and I find it interesting that there is historical context for that because it's only in this day and age where I feel like, you know, we're, we're able to make so much now, like there, there's enough food literally to feed the entire world at this point, even if we can't deliver it all in time to feed the whole world, uh, because of logistics, like there is such an overabundance of stuff. I can understand why it feels like there is no scarcity now uh, for certain things. And I find it, I just find it really interesting that periods of time, even thousands of years ago, where there was no easy way to transport, they could still have this feeling that there is no scarcity. There is no need to sacrifice anymore. Everything is good. We have our empire. We have our people. We're able to spend all of our time on our intellect because the people with the money gave us the money so we could... They pass their money down to the next generation so that we could all live good lives and we don't need to make the sacrifices anymore. So there is no need to sacrifice anymore. Th that's kind of the ethos that embodies this era. And um, and it, it is pretty interesting. Uh, Glub considers there to be a bit of a... Uh, a bit of a division between the head and the heart for people. So he thinks that they're almost competing for, um, for the focus of humanity. Either you can focus, you can focus with your heart and, uh, strive for your society and for your morals and for your nation and, um, and for your God, or you can focus with your head and just think of all these creative ideas and you can focus on improving art and natural sciences and all these different aspects of intellectual growth for society and the future of humanity but you but throughout history there's never really been a period where you have both of these things at once um and again this is why i'm saying uh, which this is also why I'm saying again, uh, progressive traditionalism is necessary to maintain those old ideals while coming forward. Um, well, traditionalism in general, but specifically I say progressive traditionalism because you need people pushing you, always pushing the society so that the people are always grabbing onto and grasping their uh roots their moral roots um i think i think that's the biggest deal with nations because the, the accumulation the summation this ends in the period of decadence let's let's not forget that the age of decadence is what follows this and uh, that's basically people give up they become nihilistic they stop uh, they stop really having the motivation to protect what's theirs because things stop mattering to them it's a it's not worth sacrificing to save the nation because there's nothing worth saving uh, is the attitude that appears to be uh the one that historically comes up among fallen empires so considering that um that's that's why i think nations need to have a foundation and they need to have a an ethos that propagates itself uh if you don't have something self if you don't have a self-propagating ethos to maintain the foundation of that nation and to maintain um the founding values and moral systems of that nation then you're screwed that's kind of my under that's kind of a brief overview i have of this um but yeah, so anyhow, as the intellectualism continues, 
uh, we end up reaching a point where rivalry becomes uh, becomes big, not just between your own head and heart and the head and heart of people among society, but among people within a society, especially political rivalries. They bec- they begin to approach absolute hatred uh, <laughs> internally, and even if even if actually especially as nations weaken. As their positions in the world weaken and there's powers around them that are starting to rise up to rival them or compete with them or threaten them, instead of their rivalries turning outward, they turn more inward. Like, say, oh, Russia's hacking into our elections. We hate you Republicans. Or, oh, uh, China's trying to steal all our money. Uh, we hate you corrupt Democrats for selling us to China. Yeah, so just thought I would throw that out there. But, and I don't know it, when the political rivalries start to really hate each other, but we've reached a point where the president has a uh, has a syndrome named after him for how much people just cannot stand him. Uh, (laughs) Trump derangement syndrome is real. Uh, It's and and that kind of that shows that uh, I don't even know if we can reach a higher peak in uh, political hatred between the two sides. I, I at least from the illiberals from the left and illiberals coming towards the right. Uh, especially considering Trump's very much a moderate in policy. I mean, again, we're we're seeing kind of that we're and and again, this is this is the beginning of the decadence period. This is there's there's all these periods kind of meld into each other, but this is technically something that it starts in the age of intellect and it intensifies during uh, the age of decadence and. There's actually some good arguments that the U.S. is currently in the age of decadence or or in the early stages of it. So I want to um, continue forward and we can um, we can show this. I, I, I have my own kind of actually analogy for uh, the political rivalries, which is um, if, you, if you think of the political state um, in a nation as a teacup that you're filling with water. And once you get uh, to the peak, to high noon, that's basically when you finished filling the cup all the way th- with water. So it's filled to the brim. But then there's a crack, a crack pokes in at the bottom. And as time goes on, the water is just slowly leaking out. And essentially, as the cup, as the cup loses water, both parties become more desperate for whatever water is remaining. That's that. That's kind of my metaphor for the internal rivalry between for the water because because we're used to the water cup filling up, but once it starts leaking out, oh no, there's not enough water for everyone. There there there's not enough room for everyone to get their fill. So now we're starting to steal from each other to try to get our fill. So that that's my metaphor for it. Um, and again, so Glub goes into a lot of back and forth around this point. So he brings up about how outbursts are very uh, homogeneous, whereas the intellectual period is very multicultural, uh, which is spurred from the commerce period, actually. So even when we were on a rise, there's actually a period where uh, a lot of immigration starts in order because people see the wealth of the other nation and they want to get involved in it. And that by itself isn't bad, but... The, but um, but Glove lays out a few issues that happen from this. Uh, so first off, you've got cultural differences uh, that e- e- even if uh, they're both, even if all the parties are very patriotic, the fact that the there are cultural differences within your within your empire within your society, um, it ends up meaning there's gonna be some there's gonna be some. Um, cracks in the society because not everyone's going to have the same background not everyone's going to have the same attachment to the country not everyone's going to have the same buy-in 
essentially. Like, if your family uh, is a family where you have sat, where there have been like multiple martyrs and sacrifices for becoming a member of a nation. You're going to have a bit more of an attachment than someone who just sees, oh, this nation is really wealthy. I can move there and make money. Uh, and even if you are patriotic, having done that, like, th there's going to be a, a bit of a crack. Just a bit. Because there is, because there is a difference there, uh, just culturally. And again, you have different backgrounds. One of you struggled from, not, from uh, the being held back from the birth of this colony or whatever you were yeah we you may have been a, we in the u.s the original uh americans were sort of being crushed by the british and they fought back and the people who came later they weren't crushed by the british so that's that's uh one pro that's one kind of small problem but it, it's still something that was is worth noting then uh so and that kind of leads into the second issue that club brings up which is immigrants tend to be less loyal than the people who come from the founders less willing to sacrifice um especially their possessions because if they're coming to to a country to gain possessions if they're coming to the country for the purpose of their commerce and their business and their wealth then then they are um then i mean that's why they're there they're not going to give it up for the country because they only came to the country for that so that that that's kind of the issue that at least historically glove has seen repeated over and over again and and i it, it makes logical sense to me i mean if people want to call that like um if you want to call that xenophobic or something i mean sure you can make that argument, but again, that, that's that's an argument of morals, not an argument of is it logically true or not. Um, so, uh, and actually not even morals. I would call that an, an argument of emotions. I would call that a pathos argument uh, about morals. But um, yeah, so continuing on, uh, he, he says um, immigrants will likely form their own their own community. So they self-segregate. And in the U.S., how many communities are self-segregated? How often do you go to an area and say, oh, this is the Asian area. Oh, this is the black area. Oh, this is the uh, Native American territory. Uh, like, there are homogeneous enclaves within the country. Uh, cities are multicultural. Um, but again... But in individual areas are just enclaves, typically of one thing. Uh, it's it's rare for there to be multicultural uh, enclaves. So that ends up leading to less of a um, that ends up leading to less of a um, communal feeling, a feeling of community, a, less of a unity between all the people across the nation and empire. So then. So then these enclaves end up searching for their own self-interest more so than the national interest. Um, and this is the one that's going to get everyone's attention because this is something that wasn't coming up back when... Well, this isn't something that was coming up too much back when um, Glove wrote this. Like, the U.S. had gone through our civil rights movement, but we were just like, okay... Everyone's got equal rights there. We're good. We're good. And Glub basically calls that out with this. Uh, he basically says that centuries-old conflicts will re-arise coming from people who were uh, previously conquered. So, uh, well, that's my summation of it. So, essentially... Um, <laughs> Essentially, any peoples that were conquered and now are were brought into the empire or people who immigrated into who maybe you fought wars with or something, they start to be like, hey, re uh, remember when you did that thing to me? Yeah, you owe me. Uh, that that seems to be the uh, that seems to be 
the message that um that Glove is talking about and I found that kind of scary because we're talking about reparations these days which tells me we're at a pretty bad point and we're, we are and this is sort of mixed in with the end of intellectualism maybe early to mid uh decadent state of things so that's kind of Again, there's things to be worried that are like red flags for us in the U.S., but overall, um, it doesn't seem like we're fully in a decadent state, though possibly we are. Again, there there's some stuff that 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 the decadent state, um, that the the decadent age kind of has as a theme that has been going on for years now and even decades. Uh, <laughs> rock and roll uh but uh you know what let's just uh get into that now because uh i think it's sort of worth pointing out some of this and uh, also i i will relate this uh as countries age they tend to become more socialistic and i can point this out because apparently the roman mobs the late roman mobs uh from the towards the end of the empire demanded free food and free entertainment nothing for free but they were still they were still demanding it so it's it, it's interesting to see how uh there is a sense of a desire for a welfare to an extent towards the end of a life and this really comes up with the uh decadence period so let's get into this so first of all the period of decadence happens and people's attitudes are essentially morals are basically all gone at this point it you are a pessimistic people um you're pessimistic and frivolous people are just uh they don't have the resolution they used to have they're they're, they're downtrodden they're just like man i don't see a point even in trying anymore uh, they're depressed and they're not wanting to take care of things. Um, they're very frivolous. Live for today, die tomorrow. He, he literally said, marry today, die tomorrow. And I'm just like, holy shit, that is YOLO. <laughs> uh, sorry for, sorry, I try to keep these pretty clean. But yeah, so he he essentially said that the 70s British version of YOLO back then, you only live once. Um, and there's a focus on celebrities for who are athletes and, and there's a focus on celebrities who are athletes, actors, and artists, and not, uh, statesmen and leaders in, um, the government or military. So there's a focus on very, uh, vain, essentially, celebrities, uh, rather than, uh, moral pe moral peers mo moral uh moral authorities um and i i've got another quote here and <laughs> sorry that that was the quote about women uh i'll i'll get into women in a bit but yeah so women are a sign that you are in women being in politics is a sign that you are in the decadence period apparently so uh <laughs> you know what let's jump into that because so we've got the, uh, he also says that the five day work week is a sign of the period of decadence. So l let's go a bit into this woman thing, because I, I know you guys are going to be dying to uh, get some kind of an answer on this, because some, some of you are women, and you're not going to be too happy about me saying that women are a sign of decadence. <laughs> so let's get into this. Um, I'm on the wrong page. I'm sorry. So I love this pulled up just so we could get into this, because I know this is going to be a controversial thing. Um, so let me get a bit into, I'll get a bit into the pair, pair. Yeah. You know what? I'll do the women and then I've got to go back and I want to point out another point, another uh, subject because, so this comes from his uh, section on the Arab decline. This is the decadence period of the Arab empire um, back in the 800s, mind you. So he he just starts off 
a paragraph saying an increase in the influence of women in public life has often been associated with national decline. So, women, I will give you a moment. Okay, you good? <laughs> uh, remember, this is not my words. These are the words of John Glove. I just want to study how the rise and fall of empires. Uh, I, I had no idea that this was coming, but I find it hilarious. So I will be I, I will be open about that. I find this a bit hilarious and also uh, kind of scary, considering we might have President Kamala in a year. So, um, yeah, so he talks about how the, the late Romans complained that women, uh, that although Rome ruled the world, women ruled Rome, <laughs> which, again, that's... It's so politically incorrect. I find it hilarious uh, at this point. But even it, so, in, in Rome and in, in the Arab Empire, women were beginning to demand admission to profes professionals that were um, previously monopolized by men. And uh, historians from uh, from the Roman Empire wrote uh, wrote what have the professions of clerk tax collection or preacher to do with women these occupations have always been limited to men alone um so it kind of shows the way people were thinking very traditionally back then um as the women were first trying to get involved uh, which you could see that in the u.s back during the women's rights movements there was a lot of that type of why do women want to get involved in work why do why do women want to leave the house and be involved in all this other stuff um so it seems that historically men do not understand women and uh w women do tend to like to get out of the house every now and then too um we, we, apparently women like to practice law um or get positions in university again uh remember a part of the decline of um during the affluence period was that universities uh became less about forging men into uh hardy and strong moral men and more about uh gaining a career and becoming quote unquote successful, affluent, uh, all that. So this is a point where women are kind of trying to also join men in becoming affluent on their own. And now they're getting jobs in university. So it's kind of going to be, so of course the women who are getting jobs in university, they had to want, to, they had to seek out becoming affluent in order to pursue that type of career. So it's kind of a cascading effect. You can uh, surmise from that uh, just a little bit. Um, let's see. Women were trying to become judges, so it appears that it did not succeed back in the Arab Empire. Um, but we've got ACB here. Yes, we do. Uh, she should uh, be voted in relatively soon. So, <laughs> again, I just... I, I find some of these comments just somewhat funny because it's so similar to to, to today. And I, I feel like there's no way I could talk about this stuff without coming off as sexist in a way. I'm not trying to. I love my girlfriend. I'm very happy. I have my mom. I love her. Uh, she annoys the crap out of me, but I still love her. So, like, I've got a sister who I also care about. Uh, she scares me, but I love her. <laughs> but yeah, so you have all these different aspects of uh, women getting in. And even Glub himself says, uh, when I first read these contemporary descriptions of 10th century Baghdad, I could scarcely believe my eyes. I told myself that this must be a joke. The descriptions might have been taken out of the times today. The resemblance of all the details was especially breathtaking. The breakup of the empire, the abandonment of sexual morality, the pop singers with their guitars, the entry of women into the professions, the five-day work week. <laughs> I would not venture to attempt an explanation. There are so m many mys mysteries about human life which are far beyond our comprehension. Um, 
And that's another thing. Glup's just like, yeah, humans have limits. Like, we need to admit we have limits. <laughs> that we just can't comprehend some things. But And the consistency with that with which these things happen is kind of crazy and yes he did mention pop singers with guitar so let me go back and mention this because i didn't really talk about this yet but back in baghdad in the 800s they had pop singers who would sing erotic songs on a lute which is an instrument very similar to a guitar a stringed like play with two hands instrument that you strum oh my gosh like that's rock music he he's describing he's describing rock music from like the 70s and 80s i mean we're, we're looking at the things that define the period of decadence we've had a five-day work week for about a century now we've had women in the workplace it kind of started about a century ago, around the time women got the right to vote, but it was really uh, around World War II in the 40s, and after, women really got in the workplace, women started getting really in the workplace, and like, ever since the 80s or 90s, it's been pretty much like, almost as many women in the workplace as men. So we, we're d decades into that. Um, like, we're a century into the five-day work week. We're a century into women's... We're at least half a century... At least half a century, uh, more than half a century, into women in the professions, uh, and arguably up to a century. But like, more than half a century into that. Um, the abandonment of sexual morality, I mean, just... Uh, let's just say the 70s for now. Uh, so that's another 50 years. Um and yeah so there is uh i mean glove even was saying this back in the 70s that you could see all that stuff on, on the television then but i mean at the very least uh he's from britain and the british empire technically ended in uh, 1914 so he he has the excuse of saying hey his country is just a fall is still a fallen empire, still in decadence. Um, we are still the U.S. is still an empire, so that's kind of freaky a bit for us because uh, we've hit all those notes. And let me get into now the uh, let me get into now the other things that sort of fill up and represent this period of decadence which is welfare philanthropy and generosity and, and, and you might say philanthropy generosity and welfare what how, how does that precede decadence how is that a part of decadence um well with generosity there are p towards the end of nations lives towards the end of empires there they tend to push for the rights of citizens to be uh bestowed upon all people just gonna let that one sit out there um <laughs> citizen citizenship being bestowed upon all people anyone who wants to come to the country can can join and become a citizen uh, of course there are no modern pushes for that in the u.s None whatsoever, clearly. Uh, and clearly, I'm messing around with that there. We all know what the left is pushing for these days. Um, governments grant the poor free education to higher university. Yep. And in this case, he's just talking about, he's not even talking about just free university. He's just talking about grants. That's right. N not Bernie Sanders free college for everyone thing. He's saying if you earn a grant, that is a part of decadence. My mom got a grant to go to college. How many years ago? 30? No, 40 years ago, my mom got a grant to go to college. So government grants, generosity and philanthropy a and welfare kind of all in one. If you really think about it, um, and here's 
the last big one that he mentions, free hospitals. Yeah, so what's the big debate about these days with, uh, well, outside of immigration and uh, economics, there is the uh, whole health care debate going on the whole ACA thing and free health care for everyone and all of those other things that Bernie Sanders and Biden and public options that people want and more than just public options obviously um yeah I know I'm stuttering a lot through some of this I know I'm saying I'm a lot I know I'm not getting smoothly through through everything I'm going through but there is a lot to this and it's kind of a lot to take in yeah this is so th this is crazy and so that's mainly what focuses around the people but there's also some other aspects of this um so regarding the people at this point during the decadence period, there is a bit of a uh, another aspect of it. So over the time leading up to the decadence period, atheism begins to spread. And into the decadence period, atheism is spreading a lot. But, but, during the decadence period, in small group, in small communities or small individual, like just individual persons even, there become resurgences in religiosity. So, your nation falls to atheism. It grows more and more atheistic or agnostic. Just uh, people lose their attachment to God. And some people who will recognize this will start to make moves to sort of bring it back. They'll be. They'll look back on the days of uh, the religious and morally strong foundation and say, "That is what we need. That is what is good and right, and we need that in the world today because the world is just so depressing and falling apart." So people start to, uh, people start to uh, resurge their their morality and their religiosity. I, I found this fascinating, and, and, it, and it made me think of how, like, Dave Rubin is, as he learns more and more, he's becoming more and more uh, involved in his own religion, too. He's becoming, he's going to uh, the synagogue sometimes, and just a little bit, but, like, and I see the stories uh, with, like, Jordan Peterson going through his biblical studies, and you see the impact that that has on people, the popularity of it, like, there's some real popularity of lectures about Genesis. Like, I mean, acad academic and philosophical slash uh, psychological studies of Genesis. That 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 does that does not sound like a popular topic. I mean, maybe if you're in a religious institution, it be it seems popular, but it's popular across kind of across society these days. So again, we may already be at the point where we're having these uh, religious resurgences in values. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, I've got another, a little bit more on the page left of notes. So I'm going to walk through this and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the U.S. after this. Um, but yeah, so the age of decadence isn't just about, though, the people. It's actually about the decadence of the system itself. So the decadence of the people can happen in the intellect period, and it tends to really start with the period. This is the stuff that should get you worried, though, because this is about the government, which, I mean, technically uh, welfare, philanthropy, generosity. Uh, we talked about that with, like, the government giving grants, want to do citizenship for everyone, free health care, all that stuff. Like, th that is government involved. But there isn't... The age of decadence is really about the decadence of the government, and this is sort of what's uh, a little scary. Um, uh, 
So, so uh, yeah, that was a small note that I'll talk about later. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so if we look at uh, decadence as sort of an institutional thing, it, the, the main thing that Glove brought up with this is that if people leave the system that has fallen to decadence, they will leave their decadence behind. They will they will adjust to where they move to um, fairly quickly, and within gener within a generation or two, uh, their kids will basically be native to whatever place whatever place they move to. But again, then they'll be the immigrant who kind of is a crack in the system in whatever place they move to. Um, but uh, so Glove kind of defines, and again, this is my own summation of it, but he kind of defines decadence uh, in this way as it being a moral and spiritual disease where citizens will no longer save themselves as they are not convinced there's anything worth saving. That's my super brief summation of it for sort of the culture of it. But there is the aspect of the government where it's like, in the system where it's like essentially the system begins to get changed like there there begin to be shifts in the way in the traditions of the system that start to break it down and again i i i he, he doesn't explicitly say this but i think this is from the, the hatred in the political battles that happens where um essentially one side or another is trying to take over and they may start to change the system to enable themselves to do this <clears throat> and to strengthen their positions, which, um, so this is a part that has me worried because we, because Schumer back in, what was it? 2014 activated the nuclear option for the courts for getting, um, which justice was that? I'm forgetting her name, but, um, yeah, this, so th back in 2014, when they needed to fill a Supreme court seat, they decided to give her the filibuster and activate the nuclear options, be able to vote in, a, a, a um, Supreme court justice with a simple majority instead of the usual 60, but with instead of the super majority. So that is a clear sign of decadence in the U S government institutions, um, and this is the stuff I've been wanting to build to is we've got some signs for this in the U S so going through, looking at the list of, uh, looking at all the topics of decadence that I talked about that club has gone through in his, uh, in his essay, we've got, um, we've got the, for our own side of things, we have the nuclear option for the courts. Uh, I, I know there's a push to end the filibuster, and it, technically they already kind of did that with nuclear option for Supreme Court justices. Um, there's increasing welfare, and heck, the welfare state in itself is a massive sign of is a massive like push into a decadent behavior because you're you're taking away the uh you're you're taking away the moral foundation and the and the self-reliance that is necessary to maintain the moral fortitude of your people by creating a welfare state. Um, and I, I know it helps people, but it helps people at the cost of the nation, literally and both literally and figuratively. It, it helps people at the cost of the nation. Um <laughs> I don't think we need to say anything about political othering with um, with Trump derangement syndrome and even people there. It, it, there was that recent article. Uh, James Lindsay uh, reposted an article or a link to an article where some uh, left wing media outlets we're literally calling for the end of the U.S. Constitution for a new system to be made. That is, that's not just decadent. That is trying to end our empire to create a new one. 
Maybe it wouldn't even be an empire what they created. It probably wouldn't be. But it, it's calling for an end to our superpower as it is. So that's the fall of a nation. And in, in the U.S., there's such a big acceptance and even a positive outlook on socialism these days, even more than capitalism by a lot of uh, metrics or a lot, at least a lot of polling. That That is scary because, again, that's an end to the U.S. system. And, of course, got to mention this, women are in politics now. And when Joe Biden said that uh, Kamala Harris is as smart, as smart as the devil, well, I think he may have meant a little bit more than just her smarts. <laughs> uh, I, I, I definitely think he chose the appropriate word to describe her with that. Um, <laughs> so... I mean, I'm trying to make light of some of this stuff uh, because this this is scary. I, I'm not going to lie. When I was reading through this, I was somewhat terrified and I, I was always trying to justify to myself sort of what stage we were at. And I was making sort of predictions as to where certain things will align. Um, I was not expecting Woodrow Wilson to be his prescribed peak of the U.S. I would have expected something like uh, maybe going into the Roaring Twenties or coming out of it, which, I mean, I guess Woodrow Wilson was right before the Roaring Twenties, but, like, it depends on if you're going for the beginning or at the end of his presidency, for one thing. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of... It's freaky, man. It, 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 I'm not gonna lie. It, it's it's a little freaky, especially when we see people doing some of these things that would be considered more decadent, like trying to change our systems of government to function in ways that are more beneficial for one side or the other, and all of the political hatred. Um, and I don't see so much hatred from the right to the left. Like, there's animosity, but I don't see hatred typically. Usually I just see, like, you're a dumbass is the phrasing I usually hear the most. Uh, basically, read from uh, that 70s show, talking to talking to his kids. Um, but from the left to the right, I mean, again, and I, I, I think I've mentioned this story before. I have a friend who... I just mentioned the name Jordan Peterson to before, and, and Peterson isn't explicitly right wing. Like he he's just a comment. He he's just he's not even a political commentator. He's like a philosoph a philosophical commentator, and the only the most political thing he comments on is communism bad. <laughs> but even that, just mentioning that name. My friend was so full of hate, he turned red in the face, started complaining about a number, uh, throughout the names of a number of other people who'd be considered right-wing um, political actors. And he, like, the conversation had to end there because he was going to lose it. And that's kind of, that was years ago at this point. That was like, that may have been two years ago at this point. So, and we all know things have only gotten more intense since then, especially with the riots that have gone on since this past summer. And we have these conflicts from previously, uh, from groups that were previously um, uh, held, da held down by our country or whatever. Uh, we, we have uh, the black communities that were enslaved that um, looking at this, I mean, it almost makes you think that if you need to cut off immigration that um, or outside influences to an extent, if you, if you need to, it almost makes it sound like the only way to survive is to fully isolate yourself from other cultures or other groups. So it seems like 
almost the U.S. would have had to basically kick out uh, every former slave after they were freed in order to avoid the situation we're in now with uh, with that and the situation that we could end up being in. So that's kind of scary. My friend's black. I don't want him to leave. <laughs> but uh, um, but it's it's weird and kind of crazy and it, it's definitely an uncomfortable conversation it's it's definitely uncomfortable because there is there there is so much like personal stakes in this there is a lot of morality that we've been raised with that we've been developing over the years that just it feels like our society should be a certain way to be morally good. Our society, we, we shouldn't be going out fighting wars. We should only be defensive. We shouldn't uh, conquer things. Like, that's not good. That's immoral. Uh, we shouldn't... We shouldn't ostracize other people. We, sh we, we shouldn't... Uh, we shouldn't be upset that people want to retain their culture. Uh, we, like... We like we should we should embrace people's individuality and their cultural differences and uh, different groups intermingling for all these different purposes and uh, like the, yeah. in my head, I feel that there's ways to overcome all these types of different issues, or maybe in my heart I'm thinking that and. In a part of my head, I'm just like, when when I see it recurring over and over and over again through history, that this is what leads to the end of empires. It makes, it makes me think, are we the baddies? <laughs> to, to quote Tim Pool, are we the baddies? All right. is, is, our, is this philosophy wrong? It, like, maybe intellectually... It is brilliant. Maybe from an intellectual perspective, this is like, and and considering this comes through the intellectual age, so it, it seems right that maybe intellectually this is the best thing you can do. But from a uh, from a from the life of an empire, from from the from the point of view of the lo of seeking the longevity of the empire. Maybe it isn't. Maybe, maybe everything uh, moral that we know from our society, um, not necessarily from our religions, but from our society, maybe it's all wrong. And that's kind of, that's going to be a weird conversation to grip over. I, I think... I will talk about that more later because I, cause I, I'm going to go into some self-exploration with this because I think I think it's kind of crazy. Um, and, I mean, it, it reminds me of when Jordan Peterson had that conversation. It reminds me when Jordan, P Jordan Peterson had that conversation. Um, I think, was it with Vice? I, I, I forget who it was with. But um, he was talking about how they brought up how they brought up men and women working together and Jordan Peterson just says, well, can men and women work together? I'm just like, the guys just like, well, yeah, of course we can. I'm just like, but can we, I don't know. Look, look, look at the evidence of the past, uh, 50 years, men and women, like there's all these rape accusations and all this other stuff going on. And we don't, it's kind of new and we don't really know if we can, if it's a good thing or not. And it's going to take some time to really analyze and, you know how Jordan Peterson speaks, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to consider. Like maybe men and women just don't work well together. Maybe, maybe that's what, maybe that's history's lesson. Men and women need to have defined roles. And if those roles break down, then society breaks down. Maybe that's what it's saying. Um, maybe there's an aspect of just uh, the strain caused by having so 
having the entire population in the workforce. Uh, maybe there's an economic strain there. Um, because it, it, it seems to me that as this is on, when, as this is a part of the decline, it might be that, um, that cup, that the reason women are entering the workforce is because the cup is getting so low. Like going back to my cup metaphor with a, where the water is draining out of it, maybe the women are just trying to join their husbands or just do for themselves because their husband, because if, when the cup's not f being filled, when the cup is being filled, the women can be taken care of. But when the cup is draining, there's not that ex, the, the guy isn't going to make enough on its own or the parents are going to make enough on their own to take care of their daughters or to take care of their wives. So that's kind of, uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 there could be so many aspects to this, but my thought is maybe it's actually an economic reason why that's a part of the decline. Maybe, maybe it's that, hey, we're we're in an economic period now where everyone needs to work, and and uh, people there's not enough wealth to go around. That's why people are now suddenly working five day weeks instead of seven day six or seven day weeks, like. They're trying to like uh, do these things to cover up the fact that there's an economic decline and then more women enter the workforce because there's an economic decline. They're not getting taken care of. So now they need to they need to be more active and maybe that's sort of what's going on. Uh, maybe men and women just don't play well together in politics. Uh, maybe something else. But yeah, I, I know I'm caught up on the women thing, but. I'm also caught up a bit on this, uh, on this pop thing, on the, uh, sexy music thing. That's kind of funny and intense, but yeah, th th there are so many very interesting questions. Like what, what can we do to make sure that the, uh, we're not haunted by the ghosts of our past? we're not haunted by the sins of our past um anymore and i mean like these days they're saying reparations but it will would that actually end things i don't think it would i i i i, th I think especially because there's so much um uh, mixed blood in the u.s these days i don't think it, that I, I don't i don't think there's any effective way to do it there's so many people who weren't in the U.S. back then, who would end up having to give for reparations? So I, I don't see, and there are so many people who, who are black who would probably receive reparations just because they're black, even though they probably came to the U.S. well after slavery. Um, so like, there, there, there's so many weird issues like this that, um, yeah, you really have to think: is there a way to avoid the worst parts of this is there a way for our country to survive and i will talk more about that in my i will talk more about my ideas for that in my next uh, my next construct cast i hope you guys have liked i've enjoyed it uh remember if you liked it hit the like button if, if you uh give, give it that thumbs up if you are not yet subscribed hit the hit the subscribe button uh just pound it smash it do whatever you want give it a love tap uh but get that button clicked and um if you're not following me on commutationconstruct.locals.com be sure to visit me there uh link in this description below if you're watching on youtube or bitshoot and yeah i think that is everything for now i i will leave a link to glub's essay down below and we and if you want to discuss it further in the comments we can do that uh be sure to leave a comment and yeah i i look forward to continuing this conversation and many more with you guys i will see you next week with our uh part three to our rise and fall of empire series and and i i do have more stuff in between now and then for you guys so i i hope you're looking forward to all of it um I, I, I'm really hoping that we can build something here and 
help our country and just do something good. Um, that that's what I want. That's what I want. I I I, I, I like. I know I focus a bit on some of these more politically incorrect things that or that kind of stood out to me, and I even find them I find them a bit funny just because they're so like not the way I was raised to think. So all this stuff is kind of crazy. All of the discussions are kind of crazy, but I'm glad to be able to have these discussions with you guys, talk to you about this, uh, and kind of introduce you to these ideas. So it's been a blast. I've had fun talking to you guys, and I will talk to you more soon. All right. See ya.